in the summer of 2008, the United Kingdom is under siege. Over three months, nearly 200 UFO sightings sweep across Great Britain. How big it was, if it had come nearer, I just don't know. A huge triangular object, like one seen over the United States. I've never seen anything like it. And new images surface. In one, an unknown object in close proximity to a tornado. This is probably the best photographic evidence I've seen yet. In another, something bizarre is photographed tumbling through the air. And strangest of all, a police helicopter hotly pursues an unknown craft. Police claim that the helicopter chased the UFO. Could there be a reason for this sudden UFO escalation? The object accelerated 10 times as fast as a military jet. And is the British government hiding something? This is case number 52004, UFO Storm. The object was, I would say, between 100 and 120 feet. It was a, a round shape, a sphere, and it was rotating. And I said, am I going crackers? Can anybody see this? Summer 2008. In countless cities across the United Kingdom, accounts of strange lights, unexplained objects, and other bizarre phenomena attract the world's attention. Record-breaking numbers of reports dominate front-page headlines and nightly news broadcasts. In Liverpool, 13 strange orbs. In Ramsgate, a giant flying triangle. In Bristol, a hovering silver object. In Birmingham, three low-flying disks. An epidemic of UFO sightings covers the British map. By the end of August, nearly 200 sightings have been reported, and the numbers are increasing. We've landed here in the United Kingdom because currently, England is the world's hotspot for UFO sightings. As UFO investigators, this is exactly where we want to be, where the phenomenon is the most active. What we're getting is videographic and photographic evidence of of orbs, of triangles, even one case related to meteorological phenomena. Bill Burns will look into a breaking case involving a police helicopter that nearly collides with a UFO, and then gives chase to the object. There were conflicts. The police denied it, the Ministry of Defense denied it, but witnesses said it really happened. Pat Uskert will uncover never-before-seen video of an object that may have ties to an American mass sighting. He's pretty impressed by what he saw that night, and he thinks he, he's looking at some kind of UFO event. And Dr. Ted Ackworth will hunt down and analyze compelling pictures which seem to show a UFO approaching a tornado. The object was very, very close near this twister. Are those related? Is there some cause and effect? I'm not sure, but I'd like to find out. This epidemic of UFOs has happened before, across the Atlantic. June 1952. Throughout the United States, an alarmingly high number of UFO sightings sweep from coast to coast. The following months come to be known as the Summer of the Saucers. The sightings seem to peak when two Pan Am pilots spot six glowing red disks while flying over Newport News, Virginia, on the night of July 14th. But just days later, on July 19th, the wave reaches a breaking point. In the skies over Washington, D.C., air traffic controllers at Washington National Airport track several objects flying over the White House. But the objects vanish before Air Force jets can scramble. Now, there is a new summer of the saucers. 
but this thing was just motionless, it just stayed there and every now and then it would flash. I didn't believe in, in extraterrestrial life and, and until I saw this, this UFO. Whatever is happening in the United Kingdom has left many residents rushing to record their encounters as proof that something is going on. I'm about to meet with Steve Tuzer, who witnessed some strange lights at the height of this UFO wave. He's got some interesting video, and we're going to check it out. May 10th, 2008. University of Wales student Steve Tuzer is walking back to his dorm after a late night soccer game. But his night is about to get a lot more exciting. Well, it was on May the 10th, about 11, between 11 and 12 at midnight and I happened to have my handheld camera. I looked straight into the sky and I saw these strange lights and they started doing these strange formations, like triangular formations, and it was like bundled together and it was just, I've never seen anything like it. So I quickly got my camera and filmed it all. Steve's video shows the unexplained formation of lights moving from west to east through the night sky. As they move, however, a fourth light appears. What you were looking at in your viewfinder, could you also see that with... Far away, because I couldn't really zoom that close into them with my camera, so they were very far away. What was their trajectory? Most of them went across the sky. Did they uh, exhibit a sort of independent movement? Yeah, it's like they were, it's like they were like together talking to each other or something. I don't know, just doing something. And there's different formations, and then they would just disappear. I have to say, the footage is very interesting. Uh, we are looking at lights in a formation that are hovering over the town. Now, uh, because of the distance and, and the, uh, the quality of the camera, I can't really know what, what these lights were, but uh, that's why we're gonna have it sent to the lab and have Ted analyze the footage and, and, and see what he can make of it. Steve Tuzer isn't the only person perplexed by strange objects in the British skies in the coming months. July 28th, in Barry, 160 miles west of London, retired professional photographer Roger Williams is relaxing in his backyard when he notices something flashing in the afternoon sky just above the roof of his house. What I actually saw was um, some flashing in the sky, bright flashing. My first thought that was uh, an aircraft tumbling but then Roger notices the object is not losing altitude. The saucer-shaped metal object appears to be spinning in place. So you saw the object up here, and what happened next? Well, I thought um, after I watched it for a short while, I decided to go upstairs to get my camera. Roger snaps these pictures from his bedroom window. He photographs a silver-colored object against a clear blue sky. The object is blurry, but visual processing should be able to enhance the image to get a better look. Roger also captures a passing airplane, which provides an instant visual contrast that will be important in future analysis. I realized that there were no wings or anything like that. It was a, a sort of a donut shape with reflections around the edge. Uh, so obviously it wasn't a, a plane or anything like that. Roger has an unobstructed view while taking the photos. Right, so you had a good perspective right, right outside, and you weren't even shooting through glass. No, no, no glass, just straight through there. It's up in that direction. Yeah, and it looks like you were stabilizing your hand on the side of the window. That's right. Yeah. All right, well, those are great shooting conditions. After taking the pictures, Roger immediately loads them into his computer for a better look. How many did you take all together? Well, it's basically about four or five shots. And you took those over the course of how, how much oh, time? just a couple of minutes. The similar focal planes of the object and the airplane flying nearby provide important visual information. So this is a really interesting question to me, is because in this frame that has both the aircraft and our object, they appear to be in relatively similar quality of focus. So they are probably at similar distances, but I think it really depends on what the settings were for the lens. From that, we should be able to get a sense of the depth of focus. By obtaining the lens settings and aperture from Roger, 
Ted can now conduct a complete photo analysis to see if he can identify this silvery tumbling object. I have to say this is probably the best photographic evidence I've seen yet. But Steve Tuzer's and Roger Williams' sightings are just paving the way for the most controversial event of the summer. On June 7th, 2008, just outside of the Welsh town of Cardiff, a police helicopter reportedly preparing to land at St. Athen Royal Air Force Base is nearly struck by a UFO. To many researchers and news agencies, this is Britain's most compelling UFO case in years. I'm meeting with British ufologist Andy Russell. Andy is a specialist in UFO sightings here in Wales. Bill meets with Andy at the perimeter of St. Athen Royal Air Force Base, the focal point of the entire encounter. The whole incident started here at RAF St. Athen early hours on the 8th of June, although some witnesses have seen a craft around the area on the 7th. When the helicopter was coming in to land, the crew noticed a small UFO approaching it at a high speed. The crew took evasive action. Originally, South Wales police claimed that the helicopter chased the UFO. We've got witnesses in Cardiff and St. Malins and a few other areas that have witnessed that chase. Later, South Wales police have retracted that statement and said that the chase never took place. Why would the police change their story? Bill has tracked down a lead that may prove the authorities are involved in a cover-up. We found a commercial pilot who was in that airspace that night. He was approaching Cardiff Airport, and the tower radioed him and said, be advised, a police helicopter is tracking a UFO in your airspace. One pilot's confession may help prove the authorities gave chase to a UFO. What were the police following? And were they trying to keep up with technology well beyond their own? The object accelerated 10 times as fast as a military jet. In the summer of 2008, the United Kingdom has become a center for frenetic UFO activity. Reports, pictures, and videos have been captured all over the country. But nowhere has a case intrigued more people than the Welsh city of Cardiff, where a police helicopter reportedly was in a near collision with a UFO and gave pursuit near St. Athen Royal Air Force Base in the early morning hours of June 7th. At least one pilot reported he was told by air traffic control that a UFO had encountered a helicopter in his airspace, stay away. UFO hunters are in the UK to investigate the events taking place in the summer of 2008. They are working with local news agencies to locate credible eyewitnesses. With no video or pictures known to exist, the Cardiff helicopter incident is at the top of the investigation's most wanted list. Bill Burns is contacted by a pilot who says he was in the skies the night of the incident and he was alerted by air traffic control to the situation. Today I'm meeting with the commercial airline pilot who was warned out of Cardiff Airport airspace by the tower because they said they were tracking a UFO and a police helicopter. But after several hours, the pilot doesn't show for his scheduled interview. Originally, he agreed to talk with us and tell us the entire story. Then he abruptly canceled. He won't return our phone calls. His initial emails show he is eager to participate. But after the missed interview, a final email shows he has changed his mind about discussing the case. 
and won't say why. With the pilot now out of the picture, the investigation needs to locate more eyewitnesses. Pat meets with Andrew Dagno, a reporter from Media Wales. Andrew has also experienced eyewitnesses going suddenly quiet. For him, it happened after speaking with sources inside the police department about the helicopter chase. A policeman was driving a helicopter so that he saw what he said was a UFO and chased this UFO out across the east into the Bristol Channel where it then disappeared. So how did you come by this information? The police actually reported this to us and that's what made it so significant was that it was actually coming first hand from the authorities. Andrew Dagnall's police sources confirmed that one of their helicopters chased a UFO. But later, authorities offered up a contrary statement. According to the South Wales Police Department, quote, there were a variety of aircrafts of different shapes and sizes. In all probability, this sighting has just confirmed that one of these was in the area at the relevant time. The helicopter did not follow it or chase it across the Bristol Channel. Have you been able to get in touch with, uh, with the police officers that were involved in this incident? We've never actually been able to speak to him. That makes it difficult for us to pursue as a story because, you know, we're getting nothing back now from the police. This seems to be very common with these sightings. Something big happens and then they attempt to uh, uh, cover it up, basically. I, I think we're onto something, that, that something really did happen over Cardiff involving what appears to be a genuine UFO. Bill is now seeking connections between the various events taking place this summer. To further understand what may be going on, he is meeting with Nick Pope, a former Ministry of Defense investigator who was assigned to UFO cases by the British government. So we have a video that someone shot of an object over South Wales, and I'd like you to take a look at it and see if you think this resembles anything like the descriptions that you've received. I mean, it's a fascinating piece of footage. It's interesting. Many of the Cosford witnesses talked about two lights, um, and it was, it was only later that some of them, particularly those who saw it really close, noticed a third and fainter light. But, but yeah, that is similar to what's been reported at Cosford. The Cosford incident took place on March 30th and 31st in 1993. It involved over 100 witnesses who saw two or three lights on what they believed was a triangular-shaped craft. The incident entangled two Royal Air Force bases, Cosford and Shawbury. What's at these bases that would interest some kind of other craft? Shawbury is somewhere where helicopter training is undertaken. Uh, Cosford is basically an engineering base. Uh, so it's a, it's a wide mixture of different establishments. These aren't just UFO sightings, however. These are craft that actually go over the base, they hover over the base, they linger over the base. More than that, in relation to the Cosford incident, one of the Air Force witnesses told me that um, the, the object accelerated away probably 10 times as fast as a military jet. It's not just lights in the sky. When it comes to sightings at military establishments, whatever this phenomenon is does seem to be paying particular attention. We don't know what these things are, but they're in our airspace and we want to know. Though it may be impossible to know why these sightings are happening, witnesses continue to be amazed at what they are seeing. Local media assistance has helped uncover an eyewitness who saw the Cardiff helicopter event on the night of June 7th. Sometime after midnight, Amanda Berry is in her kitchen, preparing to turn in for the evening, but soon realizes her night is just beginning. Well, I was basically, you know, sort of washing dishes, doing normal, you know, just usual things, working on my computer. Mm. Uh, you know, I looked out of the window and I basically saw this, this light, sort of a, an orangey sort of light. 
Amanda watches as a helicopter emerges behind the strange light. To her, it appears to be following or chasing the object. What drew your attention to this thing? What was unusual about it? Well, I mean, it was flying quite quickly, but it was sort of flying in a, in a very smooth way, which you wouldn't, I mean, in a sort of broad arc. According to Amanda, it is able to evade the helicopter with relative ease. Did it appear that this thing was moving faster than the helicopter? Yes, yes, it, it, it did. I was getting the impression that the helicopter was kind of struggling to keep up with it, and, and it seemed to be flying along quite effortlessly, really. I mean, it was almost like as if it was teasing the helicopter, you know? Amanda's description matches what many local media outlets reported hearing from other witnesses. But skeptics dismiss this sighting, claiming it is something far more prosaic, a simple paper balloon known as a Chinese fire lantern. Chinese fire lanterns are often used in celebrations such as weddings, birthdays, and concerts across the United Kingdom. In fact, fire lanterns were launched the night of the sighting at a wedding in the town of Cowbridge, only five miles from the St. Athen base. This Cardiff case, guys, is really perplexing. On the one hand, you've got the newspapers reporting this as a banner headline. The police admit that their helicopter encountered a UFO, then the police pull back and say, oh no, nobody can talk to you. Well, it sounds like they're trying to downplay the incident, but according to some of the actual eyewitnesses, they reported that uh, they actually saw the helicopter chasing an object. The police gave this explanation that this was fire lanterns. I think we can probably devise some kind of experiment to either prove or disprove that theory. To put this theory to the test, Amanda has agreed to observe a series of fire lanterns and see if they appear anything like what she witnessed on the night of June 7th. With an eyewitness at the ready, the experiment is set for launch. Are police ignoring a case of simple misidentification? Or are they refusing to come forward because of a UFO incident at a Royal Air Force base? The investigation is in Cardiff, a Welsh city caught up in a wave of some of the United Kingdom's most compelling UFO cases in years. Video of what could be a huge craft. A strange picture of an object without wings tumbling in the afternoon sky. And a helicopter that reportedly pursued a UFO over the Bristol Channel on June 7, 2008. But official statements claim that this last incident is an overblown sighting of a Chinese fire lantern. These fire lanterns are candle-powered miniatures of hot air balloons, and they're frequently mistaken for UFOs. We have Amanda's testimony that she actually saw this thing. She saw a very strange object flying in a very peculiar fashion that was being chased by this helicopter, moving faster than the helicopter. Now, after this, this huge incident, there were reports that this was all the result of just Chinese fire lanterns. So we're here now to put that to the test. Amanda saw the object approximately 300 yards from her house. To accurately recreate her line of sight, Bill and Ted launch a fire lantern from a separate position 300 yards from Amanda and Pat. I'm down here at base one with Bill. He and I will be releasing it from here. Down this way at about 300 yards is base two. That's Pat and our witness. They're in position and ready to view our release of the lantern. What we really want is your opinion about does this thing look anything like the object that you saw on June 8th? Okay, we're going to light off the lantern, eyes in the sky. Go. Okay, we have liftoff. Copy that, we see it. Well, Amanda, well, it you looks, see it? Yeah. It Does it look anything it, like it what you saw? 
it's a lot smaller than what I saw and, and even at low altitude they're small so well even the lights on on the helicopter I saw were you know I they they were dimmer than the, the lights on the other craft you could see that they're you know electric lights they were intense these lights had intensity intense. yeah yeah and this was more of a flickering candle or like a campfire yeah. Basically, it just didn't look the same at all, really, you know. I think you've made it clear that uh, this is completely different yeah. from what you saw that night. Yeah. Ted, I just wanted to let you know that we've pretty much concluded that uh, what we've launched here this evening uh, doesn't look anything like what Amanda saw that night. Okay, Pat, roger that. There is also meteorological evidence that casts doubt on the theory that these were fire lanterns launched from a wedding in the town of Cowbridge. Cowbridge is about 13 miles to the west of Cardiff, and the winds that night, we looked at the meteorological data, are coming basically out of the north. Now, if a fire lantern was launched over Cowbridge and, and climbed up to 2,000 feet, it would be traveling in this direction, and that is the opposite direction from Cardiff. So we've got a balloon that's launched 13 miles away, traveling basically away from Cardiff. How could that ever have been sighted over Cardiff? It, it just doesn't add up. So what does that mean? It's looking increasingly like we have to look for another explanation, and that explanation might very well be it's a UFO. While one experiment has helped eliminate a conventional explanation, the photos and video from Roger Williams and Steve Tuzer may provide even more evidence. Are these similar objects to what the helicopter pursued that night? Ted and image analyst Terence Masson look for any distinguishing characteristics in the evidence. Now, the, the Roger Williams photos, I'm really hopeful for. For once, we actually have a professional photographer taking a picture of an object. I'm hopeful that we can get something really definitive out of this. Roger turns his 35 millimeter camera skyward and captures six images of a strange disc-shaped object that he at first thinks is tumbling, but then realizes is hovering in place. If we could do a sequential viewing of, of each of, of the object zoomed in, and take out the motion, mm -hmm. uh, we could see how it looks over the course of those frames. What we did was several things. Able to isolate some motion blur out of it and do some sharpening and contrast enhancement and actually overlay and sequentially analyze those six photographs, one on top of another. To me, this is pretty wild. Yeah, it's, um, it's definitely changing shape. To me, it looks metallic. It, it looks very yeah, clearly reflective. silver, like an, like an aircraft body, aluminum skin, but nothing at all like the shape of an aircraft. And what we see very definitively is it's, it's roughly donut shaped, saucer shaped, if you will. And it's very clearly over the course of that short minute and these six photographs that it's either tumbling or physically changing shape. It certainly shape. doesn't look like uh, wi any kind of wings or, or a helicopter. It no. definitely doesn't fit any of our uh, conventional aircraft profile. The fact that this metallic shiny object is hovering out there in space over the course of a minute and changing shape or rotating in place is very, very puzzling. But Steve Tuzer's footage shows something altogether different. The footage is remarkably similar to another incident that's already been closely analyzed. It reminds me a bit of the Tinley Park video in that there's that formation. On August 21st, 2004, hundreds in the small town of Tinley Park, Illinois, view three orange globes floating above their city. The video analysis seems to show that all three lights are connected. It does look like the, uh, the other two trailing points are locked to that third point. But most shocking is the size of the object. I think 1,500 is a pretty good estimate, plus or minus a couple few hundred feet. And I don't know any structure that you could fly that, would, no. that could hold lights 1,500 feet apart. Ted and Terrence believe the Tinley Park lights to be a massive single triangular object 
though it does show a fourth light, the object Steve Tuzer captured is similar. It makes me curious whether or not these lights are part of a, a larger structure. All right, so we see here the stabilized footage. Yeah, uh, the yeah. light on the left is the one that I actually pinned. Uh, and again, similar to Tinley Park. Mm -hmm. To my eye, yeah, they're to, pretty stable. To but the naked eye, they do seem uh, about the same position. It really does seem to be the structure locked together where we're doing some sort of rotation. So what Terence's analysis is telling us is that these four point sources are clearly locked together in, in formation, but it's a very sophisticated formation where they're, they're not just hovering together, but they're, they're rotating en masse as one object. It really leaves me wondering what this could be. One final photo could shed light on the dramatic increase of sightings in the United Kingdom as a photographer in Lancashire captures what appears to be a UFO approaching a tornado. Everybody has said, what is that? The latest wave of UFO sightings over the United Kingdom has seen strange triangles, bizarre silvery objects, and a helicopter pursuit over the Bristol Channel. But the most unique case might involve a UFO and a tornado. Melanie Walwork of the Lancashire Evening Post received this photo days after it was taken. Well, yeah, I thought it was certainly very interesting. It was crazy enough that there was the, the funnel cloud in Lancashire for a start, never mind now with this, you know, this thing next to it that no one was, you know, too sure what it was. But more compelling for Mel is the amount of sightings in the area, especially this summer. Do the sightings tend to come together in certain months of the year? There certainly has been a lot over the, the last few months, obviously the summer months. Lancashire is a hot spot. Though Mel received many calls and many reports, none had the evidence that Pat Regan did when he snapped his photograph. July 6th, 2008. Pat Regan is on a normal afternoon excursion with his daughter Jasmine in Lancashire. He takes this photo when he sees the tornado forming in the distance. When he arrives home, he downloads it to his computer for a better look. At first, it just seems to be a picture of the nearby tornado. But on closer examination, Pat discovers it contains something even more intriguing. Ted and Pat head out to meet Pat Regan and his daughter Jasmine at the exact spot of their sighting, the Rufford Canal. It almost looks like we could have another tornado again today. Yeah. Are these similar conditions now to it's, the day you had the sighting? It's a little bit cooler than when we saw the tornado. There was blue sky like this, but it was also quite thundery. So Jasmine first spotted the twister around here. Jasmine was playing the, and I heard her saying, Daddy, Daddy, there's a twister, there's a twister. Concerned at first, Pat realizes that the funnel cloud is far enough in the distance to take a photograph. He seizes the opportunity but he realizes he captures something even stranger when he arrives home. There was a speck in one of the pictures, and this is the speck that everybody has said, what is that? Pat enhances the photograph. In what seems to be close proximity to the tornado, he sees a strange greenish disc-shaped object. We don't know what it was. We said, well, could it be something from the Twister? Could it be an aircraft? But all these seem to be impossible because it doesn't seem to be anything like that. So you didn't see the UFO that day? No, we didn't. Well, we, we saw it, but we didn't register it in our brains. It was there because it was on the picture. Yeah, we only noticed later on. Do you know if the Twister caused any damage? Didn't get the feeling it was going to do any damage, but it only seemed to be peaking downwards some distance from actually Earth. It wasn't Earth touching down? It didn't seem to be. But when you were watching it, did you see any debris getting kicked up? Uh, at the base? No, we didn't. If the tornado didn't touch down, it probably couldn't have picked up something large enough to be the object in the picture. It seems strange to me is that we have a, a sighting of some unknown object associated with a strange meteorological phenomenon. And apparently the object was very, very close 
near this twister. Are those related? Is there some cause and effect? I'm not sure, but I'd like to find out. But with so many unidentified objects being seen this summer, many are asking why the British government isn't seriously investigating this UFO wave. The British government has upheld the importance of UFO investigation for years and recently declassified the largest number of UFO investigations in this country's history. These files contain details of hundreds of sightings of strange lights and objects in the sky from 1978 to 1992. Nick Pope, who led the UFO project at the Ministry of Defense until 2006, examined many of these cases, some of which remain unsolved. The amount of records that the MOD has on UFOs must be voluminous. Oh, absolutely, yes. We've had over 11,000 UFO reports um, investigated since the early 50s. And of course, all these cases now are beginning to come out with the release of the uh, MOD's UFO files, which has started this year. The release of the files has coincided with one of the biggest waves of sightings in the country's entire history. And so the MOD must be really frantic over what you called in the New York Times, Britain's Summer of the Saucers. Yes, it, it is. But despite what seems like transparency, little information on these newest sightings is being discussed. Uh, people are using the Freedom of Information Act to go after the records, and they're not really finding them. Now, I have a theory about this. I mean, a couple of times in the MOD, somebody said to me words to the effect of, oh, well, I'm just going to write to uh, this person about this. And I said, no, no, don't do that. You'll create a paper trail. And if there is no paper trail, then officially released documents aren't telling the whole story. So when people try to research cases like Cardiff today, you're actually partly responsible for the fact that there is no paper trail on Cardiff. Well, I'm not sure if it's my personal fault. It was just the culture of, of on sensitive issues. We were aware of FOI and sometimes did a, what you might call a workaround, as it were. Could the MOD's release of the classified files just be a smokescreen for their current UFO investigations? You can guarantee that even if there is no paper trail, the MOD is well aware of these cases and investigating. With solid meteorological data, field perspective, and a photograph, this may be the investigation's best chance of determining what's in the skies over Britain in the summer of 2008. An extraordinary photograph involving a tornado and a possible UFO has surfaced in Lancashire in the UK. Could this be the evidence needed to validate the numerous sightings sweeping the United Kingdom in the summer of 2008. I'm at the University of Manchester at the Center for Atmospheric Sciences. I'm about to meet with Dr. Grant Allen, who's an expert with tornadoes and twisters. I'm hoping that Dr. Allen can give me some information about the tornado that I can use when I get into the digital image processing. Uh, this particular tornado we're looking at here is um, a very, very weak tornado uh, with wind speeds, I would say, probably less than, less than 80 miles an hour at the vortex edge. Does, this, does it look to you like this has touched down? I wouldn't say so. Normally when a tornado forms at the top of the cloud, you get a, a thicker area and that tapers off as it, as it descends and you, you can see yeah. that. One question stands out. Is this object just a piece of debris picked up off the ground and tossed out by the tornado. Dr. Allen worked up an estimate on the strength of the tornado, detailing the force needed. The maximum velocity around the edges of the funnel was about 80 miles per hour. That at as little as 10 meters away, it could be half that velocity. So we know that the velocity of the air around this funnel is dropping off very significantly. And obviously it would take very strong winds to keep some sort of debris or object up in the air. If the tornado had touched down, and if that's a relatively large piece of debris that's left over, I would expect to see more evidence of debris either around the tornado or off this, off, off this picture maybe. 
We've looked very closely at, at throughout the entire frame, and that's really the one and only piece of debris that we're seeing. And it seems to be about halfway up the funnel. None of those photographs has the tornado been anywhere near the ground. So my hunch is that that is not debris. With this stage of the analysis complete, Ted turns back to image processing to determine the size, speed, or distance from the camera to the object. The question here is, what's the object? You know, an aircraft, a bird, uh, an insect? Uh, is, can we get our hands around this in any way? My first impression is that it is something of medium size at a pretty good distance. I am seeing what looks to me like motion blur on the object. Motion blur happens when the object being photographed moves faster than the camera and film's ability to capture cleanly. It is usually affected by the camera's shutter speed. Let's look up the shutter speed. Five thousandths. Right, so that's really fast. Shutter speed on a camera dictates whether the photo is sharp or blurry. Pat Regan's camera shutter was set to open and close at one five thousandth of a second. This extremely fast speed clearly captures the estimated 80 mile per hour winds of the tornado, but not the alleged UFO. It seems like it would have to move pretty fast in that very fast exposure time to still be blurred, because anything else that was moving at any kind of relative speed, even 80 miles per hour, a fast car, I would expect that to be crystal clear. At that, you're right. At, at that, that shutter speed, speed right? You're right. Because that's really fast. That's a good point. Further analysis shows the object moving a third of its length in the five thousandths of a second needed to take the photograph. But its exact size cannot be determined. Do we know that it's a physical object? I would say definitively yes. You can see the very uh, dark undershadowing on the foreground objects and if we zoom into this thing here we can see it's also it's kind of yeah. more light on top and dark underneath so there is something physical in frame uh, it's not something that's added after the fact or uh, or very close to camera right no debris in this area is to be expected and yet there's this large object in there traveling at a very high rate of speed right next to the tornado so it's very curious there's a lot of unanswered questions a mysterious flying triangle, a metallic sphere shot by a professional photographer, a large fast object that doesn't look like any known craft approaching a tornado. This has been a really fruitful trip. We've been able to collect what, in my impression, has been some of the highest quality photographic evidence I've ever seen. From conducting our own experiments, I'm of the opinion that there actually was some kind of unusual object that interacted with this helicopter. We found that even though the MOD is releasing its files, it's still keeping mum about cases. We're left with the possibility that we will uncover the piece of thread that will unravel the whole secret and finally reveal the truth. But even as the summer draws to a close, the events continue. September 7th, just outside of Southport, near Pat Regan's sighting of the tornado object, residents flood emergency services with reports of a blazing object falling out of the sky. September 13th, in Bristol, near the Cardiff helicopter incident, five bright orange lights circled the night sky. And September 22nd, reports of triangular lights pour in from the towns of Rose, Johnston, and Boris. As events escalate, and with more and more witnesses, the truth may be just a sighting away.